You know, every October for the last, I don't know, I've been here 13 years, so probably 12 years, we've, we have a strong missionary influence. Last week, Kevin Donaldson was so fun. It was such a great word that the Lord shared with us to encourage us to engage in the harvest. This week, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, Jordan, your brother's Jonathan. I almost like, he has a twin brother named Jonathan, but Jordan and his wife Alex and her two sweet kids are with us. He's actually been with us a time or two, twice, several, few years ago for missions convention. And uh, Jordan and his family have been serving in the Gambia and Africa. Uh, he's grown up in Africa. He speaks African and Pigeon better than he speaks English, but he grew up in Arkansas when he was in the United States, so his, his English, you, it's not good. It's not good. Now, the, uh, the Ennises are wonderful friends and uh, a great example of faithfulness over many generations. So I know your parents are missionaries um, and grew up on the missions field, and we're excited about what the Lord is doing in the Gambia, in Africa. And so this morning, I think we're going to show a video, and then, uh, Jordan, it's up to you, buddy. That last man right there, he came up out of the water after he was baptized. He's one of our Bible school students, and he screamed at the top of his lungs, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's why we're doing what we're doing, is we are trying to plant churches that plant churches on the banks of the Gambia River. So I want to first off start by saying thank you to Pastor Paul. Thank you for having us. Uh, I can remember the last time we came here, it was during COVID. And so the job that I was working at the time, you had to like check in anytime you left the county uh, and tell them where you were going. And I went into my boss and I said, so I'm I'm going to Licking, Missouri. And she said, why? (laughs) So uh, she's from uh, Houston, I think is where she was actually from. And she was just, why why Licking? And so... Uh, I was like, oh, there's a church. And so it was the first time I'd come, and we were, were happy. Uh, the last time we came, uh, we only had one daughter. We now have two. So thank you for letting us come. Uh, before I move any further, uh, I just want to say that everyone here finds you friends like Josh and Amanda Kane. So Josh and Amanda are great friends of Alex and I. They have been with us uh, through struggles. They have been with us through celebrations. They are some of the first people that we tell big news in our lives. So if you are someone in need of a friend, find you someone like Josh and Amanda Kane. Thank you, guys. We love you guys. I am Jordan. This is my wife, Alex. We are working in the Republic of the Gambia. If you'll go, yes, this is right here. We are as far west as you can go in Africa. There's this tiny little country inside this big country called Senegal. That is the Gambia. 
It's about 2.7 million people. I'll get into that a little bit more. This red pin right here on the other side of the map, that is where I grew up. So the distance from where I grew up to where we live now is about the same distance as from Nashville, Tennessee to San Diego, California. Now, I don't know about you, but people in Nashville, Tennessee are different than people in San Diego, California. They're just a little bit different. So now you're adding all these different countries, there's all these different languages, it's very different. In fact, the city I grew up in was almost a million people, and the country we've moved to is just 2.7. So it's basically completely different. Nigeria has over 200 million people. You like sneeze and you kill three people. <laughs> They're just packed on top of each other. The Gambia is a little different. It's a lot more slower pace. It's very different. But God is still the same God in Nigeria and in the Gambia. If you'll go back to the picture of our daughters, I will point out my oldest, her name is Adelaide Janelle. Now, like good Africans, my daughters, their names have meanings. See, Adelaide Janelle means Yahweh is merciful and my God is just. See, we live and work amongst a people, amongst Muslims, who have a very warped view of God's justice and mercy. They don't understand that God is not just wrath. He is also just and merciful. So we wanted our daughter's name to point to who God really is. See, our youngest, her name is Eliora Joel. And Eliora Joel means my God is light and Yahweh is God. See, we work on a continent that for years the West has falsely called the dark continent. For years, all, uh, people in the West have said all that there is in Africa is just darkness and monsters. And while we know that that's not true, even if it was, my God is light. And light cannot be beaten by darkness. Darkness has to flee from light. We believe that my God is more powerful than any darkness we will face. I am the associate pastor at Almacy Worship Center, and I also teach at the country's only Pentecostal Bible school, Almacia Training Center. So I'll get into a little bit more about what that means later on in my sermon, but we're going to start with Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm going to be bouncing a whole lot around the chapter, so just kind of bear with me. Starting in verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come... They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them clothing tongues like a fire, and it sat on each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. This is a specific time where God shows up and shows his presence. The reason that fire comes down is because that is the symbol throughout the entire Old Testament of God's presence appearing. It's a flaming sword at the Garden of Eden. It's a fiery bush when he appears to Moses. It's a pillar of fire by, day, uh, by night and a cloud by day when they're following it in uh, the wilderness. There's fire from heaven when Elijah prays. At the first temple, they pray and fire comes from heaven to dwell in the temple. This is the symbol of God's presence. That's what they're trying to explain, that God's presence is no longer in the temple. It's with his church, with his people. Going on to verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every race and every nation under heaven. Nation is important. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and they were confounded, because every man had heard them speak his own language. That's also important. It begins to list off each of these, and I'm not going to read every single uh, place where they're from, but I'm going to focus in on three, because they're important to me, because I am someone who teaches the history of the church in Africa, and this is the time when the church begins. This is the beginning of the church is on the day of Pentecost, and from the very beginning, it mentions Egypt, Serene, and Libya. Africa was a part of the church from the very beginning. Africa is not an afterthought to God. It was there from the beginning that this was God's plan for all nations to be a part of his church. 
Moving on to verse 12. And they were all amazed, and they were in doubt, saying to one another, What meaneth this? Skipping down. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk like you suppose. Let's skip a little bit. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And at the very end, he begins to say, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath. I want to talk just a little bit on some notes on what Pentecost was. First, I want to talk about Pentecost is a harvest festival. So I'm a history teacher. I teach the history of the church, and I teach all of our uh, history classes for the Bible school. So I'm going to get a little, uh, I'm going to try not to completely nerd out on you guys and be super weird. But we're going to go a little in depth. Pentecost was a harvest festival that celebrated the completion of the Torah being given to Moses. So the idea was to celebrate the completion of the word of God, they would bring in a harvest of grain. And they would bring in a harvest of grain, and that was how they would celebrate. But see, this specific Pentecost in the year 33 AD, they were celebrating something slightly different. You see, the word of God had been made flesh and dwelt among us. And that completion of the word of God being made flesh and his work on earth being done, that completion was celebrated by a slightly different kind of harvest. This was a harvest of souls. From the very beginning, this was the plan of God, that it would not be confined to just the Jewish nation. If you'll read in Luke, eight, uh, Luke 4, 18 and 19, Specifically, it begins to explain what Jesus' work was. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus says, This is why I came. And he says on the cross, this is finished. He said, we are not coming in and saying, eventually there will be freedom from, in Christ. We're not coming in and saying, eventually people are going to be loosed from their bondage. Jesus says it's already done. We are messengers. We are not people who are coming ahead and saying, eventually it's going to happen. It's already happened. We're making introductions. This is why Jesus said, this is my reason for being. And I just want to point out that this celebration of harvest was for all nations from the beginning. A little while later, in Acts chapter 10, the, uh, Peter has gone into this house and all of a sudden there's this Roman soldier who has nothing to do with Judaism. There's, there's been some other steps that have happened pointing towards this being the goal. There's actually a man from Central Africa who has come up, and he's, he's been studying the scriptures, and he's been kind of maybe Jewish adjacent for a while. And he begins to uh, be studying the scriptures, and all of a sudden God teleports a deacon out of nowhere to just appear right next to his chariot, and then he begins to explain to him what has happened. Like, I don't know of very many deacons that God has teleported to chariots lately, but uh, we believe that God can do it if, if that's what he needs. And so he's, he's teleported to this chariot. He explains the gospel to this man. He baptizes this man and then immediately teleports away again. The Holy Spirit did some interesting things in Acts. As someone whose job it is to travel to spread the gospel, it would be nice if we didn't have to fly planes and we could just teleport But that man was also Jewish adjacent. You know, he, he, had, he had converted maybe to Judaism a while earlier, and so he was studying the scripture. This man, Cornelius, was a centurion. He was a Roman. It says he feared God, but he was not a Jew. And when he and his household began to pray after Peter told them the gospel, they began to speak in other tongues, which is the exact same sign that was done before at the first day of Pentecost. And he says to everybody else, there's no difference between what happened to them and what happened to us. So this is where Peter tells the rest of the gathered uh, leaders of the church. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, that word again, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted. 
That word nation means every ethno-linguistic group, every people group. We sometimes say tribe. In, in Africa, we, talk, we have a lot of different tribes that speak different languages. And so uh, you're from Edo State, right? Right, so you're Edo? Okay, so he speaks a slightly different language than just me eight hours north in Nigeria. We, we would speak Hausa, he would speak Edo. Those are two different nations, okay? That's what I'm trying to explain. They're slightly different nations, but that doesn't mean that one nation is left out of the gospel. Peter is being clear, every nation. God is no respecter of persons. We were all a part of this from the beginning. There was a young Baptist preacher in England in the year 1787 who had really gotten a hold of it. He had been a former shoe repairman. He had, while he was repairing shoes, he would start reading uh, about other languages, and he taught himself uh, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, Dutch, and French while fixing shoes at the same time. I can't do that. I can't speak English. Like, <laughs> he was amazing when it comes to this. And as he began to do this, he began to study the Bible, and he began to really get a hold of this concept that I'm speaking on right here. He got a hold of it so much, he became a pastor, and he went to the other pastors in his area, and he said, look, God is calling me to the heathen in India. And he began to explain, he had these charts, he had a huge map, and he was, he was beginning to explain that you need to send me to India. And the leader of the meeting stood up, and he said, young man, sit down. If it pleaseth God to reach the heathen, he will do so without your help or mine. Thankfully, William Carey did not listen. William Carey becomes the father of modern missions. In fact, he continues to preach and continues to explain why God has called him to the heathen, so much so that that leader eventually becomes someone who will pay for William Carey and that leader's own son to go to the mission field. Because his heart was changed, because this is the heartbeat of God. This is not something that's a fringe doctrine. This is not something that's slightly changed. This is, in fact, God's great commission. The last commandment that we are given is to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. It was so important that Jesus said that as the last thing he said on earth. There are 7,000 languages in the world but only 23 have a complete translation of the, only 23% have a complete translation of the gospel. In all denominations, there is one Christian missionary for every one million Muslims. It's a big task. If you'll go back to the, the other slide with, uh, back one more, this right here. These are some of the people groups in the Gambia. There are 1,110,000 Mandinka who don't know Christ. The bottom left corner, she's a Mandinka. There are 447,000 Fulani, the man with the cows. They have little to no churches in the Gambia. 343,000 Wolof, the man pouring the water over his head is a Wolof. They don't have a complete Bible yet. They also have no pastors in the Gambia. 154,000 Sonike, the old man on the side. The Sonike do not have a Bible. There are 38,000 Moors. This last man is a Moor. The Moors completely refuse all contacts with Christians. These are just a few of the people groups in the Gambia that are desperately needing to hear the gospel. They were a projected part of the harvest. God came for them just as much as he came for us. To explain just a little bit about the Gambia, it's about the same population as the state of Arkansas. It's just a little bit smaller than Arkansas. And yet, Arkansas has 6,000 churches. Just the Assemblies of God has 422 churches in Arkansas. The Gambia has 120 churches total. Most of those are heavily mixed with juju, West African witchcraft. To give it a little bit more context, 
the Gambia is 113 times the population of Texas County. According to Google, which has never been wrong before, Google has told me that Texas County has over 45 churches, yet a place 113 times the size has less than 120. We desperately need churches in the Gambia. The Mandinka, that people group that I was talking about earlier, they're about the same size as Dallas, Texas, or 46 times the population of Texas County. Dallas, Texas has 2,400 churches. The Mandinka don't have one. It cost us about $7,500 to build a church in the Gambia. And we have pastors who are willing to live in the Mandinka cities. In fact, we have a Nigerian in Igbo who lives in the second largest Mandinka city right now, planting a church, and he's trying to reach the Mandinkas around him. We believe that churches are important in spreading the Great Commission. I want to talk just a little bit more about the Mandinka. Now you can go to that next slide. Several decades ago, well, let me, let me start with this. The earliest writings we have about the Mandinka are from the year 1066. If you are a history nerd like me, that's the same year that the Normans invade England. I want to be clear, we can't have this conversation right now if we're back then, because we aren't speaking this language yet. It's a different language. And the earliest writings we have about the Mandinka are that these are the people who are Muslims. That's their identifier a thousand years ago. These people have lived in the bondage of Islam for a thousand years. Several decades ago, there was one of these Muslim priests in Imam who was sitting there holding his son, and as he lay dying, he said to his family, name my son after me. Name him Muhammad Lamin Sise, and make sure he grows up to be an Imam just like me. So young Lamin, he began to travel all over West Africa and learning all that he could about the Quran. He began to study, and he, he was diligent, and he was trying to understand the Quran. But he began to have questions about a man who is in the Quran named Isa al-Masih. And he began to be a little confused about this man, because the, the Quran says so many good things about Isa. It says that Isa was born of a virgin. It says that Isa lived a good life. It says that Isa was beloved by God. He was a great prophet. He, he did many miracles. It says that Isa is coming back at the end times to speak for God again. So he had all these questions about Isa, and eventually he asked so many questions about Isa that they said, you're not interested in the rest of the Quran. You're not interested in Muhammad. So they kicked him out of studying the Quran, and they sent him home. So young Lamin, when he went home, he went to a different school, and he began to hear about who Isa really was. He heard that Isa is who the Tubabs, who the white people, called Jesus. Isa al-Masih means Jesus, the Messiah. So he began to learn that there was three very specific things that were specifically left out of the Quran. See, the Quran says basically the entire story of Jesus, but it leaves out the fact that he is the Son of God, that he died on the cross and therefore rose from the dead, and that he is the Lord of your life. If you read the writings of Paul, Paul says these are the three things that you have to believe to be a Christian. Islam is specifically designed to give just enough truth to lead people to their destruction instead of their salvation. But young Lamin, he realized the truth about Isa. So he and several of his friends, they were really excited, and they began to serve Isa al-Masih instead of Muhammad. And they went, and as they grew, uh, young Lamin changed his name to Samuel so that everyone could understand when they heard the word Samuel with the Mandinka surname that even Mandinkas can serve Isa instead of Muhammad. He was so excited, him and his friends, they began to translate the Bible into their own language so that his people could begin to hear the gospel. It took a long time. They actually had to invent an alphabet. 
And finally, they have a Bible in the Mandinka language. But one by one by one, all of the friends who had become Christians with Samuel began to leave. They began to go back to their homes. This right here is how we eat in the Gambia. Everybody shares one bowl. The patriarch has the largest spoon, and if you get too far into someone else's area, the patriarch will whack you with their spoon. It's a lot of fun when we have new missionaries. Sometimes I get to be the patriarch. When these boys became Christians, they were kicked out of the bowl. When these boys became Christians, if they became sick, their families would not pay to take them to the hospital. When these boys became Christians, they were kicked out of their shelter and their homes, and they were sent off into the streets. When these boys became Christians, when they wanted to get married, their uncles would not pay the bride price for them, so they could not get married. So one by one by one, each of Samuel's friends returned to the bull. They returned to their homes. Because West African society is designed to destroy you if you don't have a community. Samuel told me that my people have heard about Jesus for years. He said, the two bobs, the white people have been here for years. They've heard the gospel, but no one has brought them a church. They need the community of the church if they are going to leave the bondage of Islam. This is why we are going to the Gambia. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. This is a Pentecostal church. If there's one thing that I have learned being Pentecostal my whole life, I am a sixth-generation Pentecostal preacher. There's one thing I have learned. We love talking about the end times, probably too much. We love singing about the end times, say, you know, I'll fly away. We love to sing all these different songs about how we're not going to be here and how the rapture's imminent and all these different things. But the Bible has made it clear that we can speed up the end times coming. We can speed up Jesus' return if we go and preach the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. Then the end will come. This is why we are still here. This is why when we get saved, God doesn't just immediately take us up to heaven because we have a purpose. I preached the last time I was here on holiness, and I preached about that Hebrew word holiness specifically means being cleaned and set apart for a purpose. Here's the thing. The Greek word for church is ecclesia. And it means those who are called out together. It's the same concept. We have been called out as a church to gather all nations unto him. This is our purpose. A church is not a building. It is a group of people who are called into service for the most high God. We have a purpose. The last thing I'm going to talk about is that signs and wonders will proceed the harvest. The last time I was here, I told a story, and I'm going to tell it again. If you'll go to the next slide. Uh, Next one. How many of you remember the date 9-11? Okay. That is a generation-defining moment for my generation. For millennials, if you can remember 9-11, you're a millennial. If you can't, then you're Gen Z. You're the next generation. I remember 9-11 slightly differently than most people. See, I grew up in Nigeria, and a few days before... 9-11, there was a jihad called in my city. And there was this group of Muslims who they left the mosque and they began to travel through the city and they began to attack churches and they began to hunt down pastors and they began to destroy Christian businesses. And that there were these politicians, I don't know, there were these politicians that kind of gathered up these these youths. Maybe they uh, had gone to college, maybe they uh, dropped out of college, but they didn't have jobs, and so they begin to stir them up. I know that's a very weird thing. That doesn't happen in America. Politicians don't do that in America. But uh, they begin to stir them up, and they said, if, if you are good Christians, then you're going to fight back against the Muslims. That did not help the situation. All of a sudden, there's two mobs instead of one mob that the government's trying to deal with. 
And so we're hiding in our house. And as we're hiding in our house, this giant Nigerian soldier comes up to the gate. And he knocks on the gate. And he tells my dad in Pigeon, he says, no shaky. No shaking. Don't worry, because when you're worried, you shake, because you're, you're afraid. He says, no shaking. We're putting a tank at each end of the street, so if they want to get to you, they're going to have to come through the tanks. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a tank, but they are not a comforting sight. It's not like a teddy bear marching down the street. It's a tank. And sure enough, he stands on top of this tank, and he begins to yell to the two mobs. They've already set the, uh, the compound right next to us. They've already set it on fire. It was a clinic. It's been set on fire. We see the smoke. We're smelling everything. And he gets on top of the tank, and he screams to the mobs, go ahead and try it. You have your spears and your bows and arrows and your machetes. I have a tank. And the mobs look at each other, and they look at the tank, and they look at each other, and they look at the tank, and then they charge the tank. Out of nowhere, there's a flash of lightning. There's a peal of thunder. Immediately, it begins to rain so hard that the fire is put out. It begins to rain so hard that everybody has to go home because they can't see to fight anymore. Now, for those of you who did not grow up in West Africa, September is the middle of dry season. It's not the beginning of dry season. It's the very middle. It maybe rains once every 30 years in Nigeria in September. And it's a little tiny sprinkle. This was a flood that completely ended the fighting. And just like God miraculously changed the weather patterns of West Africa so the gospel could continue in Nigeria, we believe that God will continue to go before us with signs and wonders along the banks of the Gambia River so that his gospel will be preached to all nations. If we go to the next slide, I'm, I'm going to tell a story specifically about this happening in the Gambia. This man down here at the bottom, his name is Pastor Dominique. How much time do I have? Yeah, I have time. I'm gonna tell a quick story about Pastor Dominique so you understand who he is. He has spent 30 years walking up and down dirt roads in the Gambia, finding one family that will listen to him about the gospel, leading that family to the Lord, then moving on to the next family, and then to the next family, and to the next family. Pastor Dominique is a great gatherer of people. While he's doing this several years ago, he's in a motorcycle, and his motorcycle dies at night in West Africa, in the bush. And he suddenly begins to hear this sound that I cannot make, but the sound is that of a hyena. Pastor Dominique is an excellent storyteller. He just makes the sound, and everybody knows he's talking about hyena. All of a sudden, he climbs a tree. He has taken me to this very tree, and he says, this is the tree I climbed. I don't know how he knows that. They all look the same to me. But he knows the specific tree that he climbed. And as he was climbing, sure enough, the hyenas are at the bottom of the tree trying to jump up into the tree to get him. So he does what anyone else would do. He pulls out his cell phone. He starts to call. Immediately, his cell phone dies and the hyenas are still under the tree. So he begins to pray. All of a sudden, a little while later, there's some sounds and the hyenas are gone and there are men under the tree. Now, probably need to explain this. West Africans believe that hyenas are witches and shapeshifters. That's their entire uh, folklore, is that hyenas are shapeshifters, they're witches, they wanna kill you, they wanna eat you. And they will turn into humans to trick you. So there are now humans where there once were hyenas. And Pastor Dominique is going back and forth with these men about they, you know, telling him to come down. And he, so he finally he prays. He says, God, I believe that you are more powerful than the hyenas. And he steps down. And sure enough, it was the people he had called. They had come to check on him because it was at night and they couldn't get him to answer his phone again. So they came and checked on him. And everything was okay. About a year and a half ago, this is several years of, of maturing in ministry for Pastor Dominique. He was out. We had a village where we had put a farm, and under a tree on one of um, under a tree on that farm, we had a church. And there was an American pastor who had been there. He spent two years of his retirement in Africa, building farms and planting churches in Africa. And he uh, had to go home because he was in his mid-70s by that point, so he wasn't able to stay for very long. And Pastor Dominique took over the church. 
And while he was there, in the middle of his preaching, all of a sudden, everybody in his congregation starts screaming, Pastor, you have to run. This man is coming to kill you. And then they all stand up and scatter. I don't know about you. That would be a little hard to preach after that. Pastor Dominique is in his 60s at this point, and he says, I'm too old to run. (laughs) So he just stands there, and this man comes up to him, covered in red, covered in all these juju charms, and he comes up to him, and he says, I am the Alkalu, I am the chief of this village, and you cannot preach here anymore. Pastor Dominique says, I am going to preach the word of God. That's why I'm here. It's been several years since the hyenas. He's not afraid anymore. The man says, no, you don't understand. If you, if you keep preaching, I'm going to put a curse on you, and I'm going to kill you. And then you won't have a church here anymore. He says, I'm not afraid of your curses. He's, he's a mature Christian at this point. I'm not afraid of your curses. And so the man looks at him dead in the eyes, and he says, I'm the chief of this village. If my curse doesn't work, I can kill you the regular way. You will not have a church in this village anymore. So we begin to fast and we begin to pray for a week. And sure enough, the next Sunday when Pastor Dominique gets out of his taxi and starts walking towards the tree, the chief of the village is waiting for him under the tree. But when Pastor Dominique walks up to the chief, that chief kneels in front of the old pastor. He says, your Isa will not let me sleep. What must I do to serve him? You see, that church doesn't meet under a tree anymore. That church meets in the chief's house. And the chief is the one who sets up the chairs for everyone before service. And the chief is the one who tears down the chairs after service. Because this gospel, this Pentecostal moment, this harvest changes hearts and lives. It sets the captive free. This is why we are here. See, signs and wonders are not something that we need to pray for. We did not pray specifically that God would keep this man up. And that wasn't what we were praying for. We were praying for protection. We were praying that God would go before. But we aren't praying specifically for signs and wonders. I'll say this as a history teacher. When the Azusa Street Revival happened, William Seymour specifically told people not to pray to speak in tongues. That was what he said. He said, don't seek after tongues. Seek after Jesus, and the tongues will happen. Signs and wonders are not something that we have to seek after. Signs and wonders are the proof that God has showed up. When I have a friend of mine, his name's Ty Buckingham, and he uses this example. Like, when he goes in and buys something, he goes and buys a product, he doesn't come out afterwards and be like, everyone, look at my receipt for the product. Speaking in tongues is a receipt that you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the product. You will go before you and God will move in signs and wonders when you are doing what he has told you to do. That is why we as Pentecostals believe what we believe. Because we've seen God come to earth and we've seen his presence move. We've seen people get healed. We've seen wombs get open. We've seen financial deliveries. We've seen addicts be freed from their addictions. We've seen God move in mighty and miraculous ways. But we didn't look for the miraculous. We didn't pray specifically for the miraculous. We prayed to get closer to Jesus. This is a natural outpouring of who Jesus is. You cannot convince me that my generation in America is not desperate for the supernatural. See, I've been on and off in America for my whole life. And I see a lot of American media when I'm in Africa. And you cannot tell me that my generations and the ones after me are not desperately seeking after the supernatural. You can't look at any book, at any movie, at any TV show, at any video game and not see that we are desperately searching for something supernatural. Your churches have what we are looking for. You cannot be a seeker-sensitive church and hide what we are seeking. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit wants to move in your churches, let him. 
Because that is what this generation in America is desperately looking for. And that is what this generation in Africa is desperately looking for. You see, I believe that all generations have a desire deep in their heart to know God. Whether they understand it or not, they are desperately searching for him. And they will find him if they keep looking. Here's the thing. If your churches keep refusing to do what God has said, God will find another way. There's a man, his name is Modu. He works in our office. He works downstairs. We have our office on the, on the what we call the first floor in Africa. It's the second floor to you guys. Um, and so we're up on the, the, the second floor. He has a cafe on the first floor. It's very dangerous. We've gained so much weight. Um, and Modu will deliver food to my desk. <laughs> I don't even have to leave my desk when I'm working to get food. Um, and so, sure enough, the, the whole group of us in the office, we've gotten really close to Modu as he's delivering our, you know, we'll text him, hey, this is our order. He'll bring it up. We give him the money. We're all good. So we've gotten close to Modu over the year uh, that he's been working there. And we begin to kind of talk to him. Modu means, it's a, it's a shortened form of Muhammad. Modu is a Muslim. And we began to just kind of try to open the door just a little bit. We've, we've talked to him. We've prayed. He knows we're a church. He knows he's delivering food to a church. A few weeks before we left, Modu comes to deliver my mom a meal. And he says, Isa has appeared to me in my dreams. And he told me to come to you because you will tell me how to follow him. The nations are seeking for an interaction with Jesus. They desperately want him. And all we have to do is make introductions. I believe that if we obey the Holy Spirit, he will act with signs and wonders because it is the natural outpouring of the situation. It's how he wants to move, and it's the way he has designed it to work. As I'm heading towards my conclusion, this experience of Pentecost demands an action. There was a famous missionary explorer, his name was Dr. David Livingston, and he preached all over Britain saying, sympathy is no substitute for action. We have been given a task. We have been given the great commission to reach all nations. Another British missionary named Hudson Taylor was going to China and he said the great commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. Another great missionary named Scott Ennis. That's my dad. Scott Ennis says... The blood of Christ never retreats, it only pursues. This is what we are called to do. Your pastor could have any number of evangelists come and speak to you. We believe in the prophetic as, uh, as Pentecostals. He could have had someone who had a prophetic gift come and speak to you. He's a pastor. He's a teacher. Those things are all important. But the apostolic voice of church planting generally in cross-cultural environments, that's what, an apostle, that's what apostles did. I'm not saying I'm an apostle, but I'm saying I'm acting in the apostolic. The apostolic voice is needed for a healthy church. And that is why I am here. I'm not here to be an evangelist. I'm not here to be a prophet. I'm not here for any of that. I am here specifically to call you to plant churches amongst the nations. This is what healthy churches do. Growing up, my dad's best friend, if you'll go to that last, uh, the next slide. Yes, this was my dad's best friend. We lived in a place... That was very hard. We lived in a place called Yola. Brother Chukwemeka, he told me today, oh, you lived in Yola. That was a hard place. Yes, it was. The Nigerians call Yola the place where hell leaks. It would get up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit 
It was where the Sahara Desert met a river. It was extremely humid. It was extremely hot. In fact, we had a Bible school where we built the Bible school. We built the church, and it was a tin roof. And then they didn't have concrete blocks yet, so they made tin walls. And because they wanted to eventually use those tin walls as other roofs, they didn't put windows in the walls. So it's 120 degrees. You're in a tin box for a five-hour African church service. I'm trying to get across to you that it was hot, okay? The place where hell leaks was not just for the heat. It was for the demons. At the entryway to Yola, once a year, they would do human sacrifices. Witch doctors from all over West Africa would meet in Yola and have basically like an old-style camp meeting for witch doctors in Yola. But when we put the Bible school there, all of a sudden... The witch doctor said, our spirits won't speak to us anymore. And they ended up having to move their meetings all the way to Benin, out of the country. Because hell cannot defeat Jesus. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Reverend Setu was my dad's best friend, and uh, over time... All of a sudden, God called both Reverend Setu and his wife and both of my parents, spoke to all four of them individually, differently, go to Yola within about six months of each other. So we all moved together and we all lived in Yola. And the thing about Yola is that inside Yola, you have to be either Hausa, Fulani, or Kanuri to live inside Yola proper. Now, I don't know about you, but we do not look exactly like other Nigerians. So we had to live outside of the city of Yola, but Reverend Setu was able to get his way inside Yola, and he lived in Yola, and he began to plant churches all over the city of Yola. The gospel was being brought into the Hausa and the Fulani and the Kanuri, who are unreached people groups, who have been Muslims also for a thousand years. And yet, the devil was not happy. Reverend Setu's 16-year-old daughter was pulled out of school one day by two men. Pulled in front of the entire school in the courtyard. They ripped off her clothes. They cut her body. They raped her in front of the entire school. And they said, the reason we are doing this is your father is planting churches in our city. And we will keep doing this if you don't stop. They even gave her their names. Because the police will do nothing about this. And they were correct. The police did nothing about it. For their safety, the Setus moved into our house, and Reverend Setu kept planting churches in the place where hell leaks. Those churches are still there. Several years later, uh, Reverend Setu was called back to uh, his home district to be their district superintendent, and Dad was called back to Joss, uh, the same city, to work in the Bible school, so he was the bursar at the Bible school again. So my dad and his best friend are back working together, and God is moving. And then we came back to the States in 2008, and in November of 2008, we get a call. There had been another jihad. Reverend Setu was the head of his neighborhood watch, and like every other time, he went out with the men from his village, and they chased off the Muslims, and they were coming back. As they were coming back, he fell in a hole, and one of the men next to him said, Oh no, Reverend fell. The Muslims heard that was a pastor in the hole. So they ignored everybody else. They tortured Reverend Setu. They peeled off his skin. They plucked out his eyes. They cut off his arms and his legs, and they burned his body. The only way they were able to identify him was in one of the legs that didn't get burned was his driver's license. I am not asking that everyone in here go to West Africa and go and die for the gospel. I am asking that you go into your communities and preach the gospel. There are people from other nations around you that desperately need the gospel. I've lived in southern Missouri long enough to know that it is not just white Anglo-Saxon Protestants that live in southern Missouri. The nations of the world have come to you. God is sending their lost 
I used to live in Neosho, Missouri. That's where I went to Bible school. And when I was in Bible school, I would be working at Walmart and I would see houses come in. I would see wolves come in. I would see Fulani come in. I would see Somalis come in. I would see Palestinians come in. These are the unreached nations that are coming to you. I have gone to them because I believe that God is sending me to them, but God is also sending them to you. You have a purpose for the Great Commission. Reaching the lost is not just for the pastor of your church. It's not just for your youth pastor. It is for everyone who has called on the name of the Lord. You are called out to gather. This is what the church is. The wolf, if you'll go to this next slide, the wolf have a proverb, for those of you who don't speak wolf, slowly, slowly, the man chases the monkey through the grass. Sometimes, some things are difficult, they're not easy to do, and you have to do them slowly and deliberately and with a plan. In the Gambia, what we are trying to do is something that is difficult. And if we do it too fastly and we don't do it with a plan, we're going to get bitten by that monkey right there. We believe that the gospel is to create renewed Africans, not remade Europeans. I don't want everyone in the Gambia to come in and to sit down and to dress exactly like me and to sing the same songs we did this morning and to uh, only read out of the King James. And that's not what we're going there for. We're going so that they will be fully Africans, but fully Christian. In fact, we are not making our church in the Gambia to be an exact clone of the churches we had in Nigeria. We are making Gambian churches. They will be fully Gambians, but fully servants of the Most High God. Jude one twenty three says, Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. That's what we are doing. I've got one last quote, and then I'll read one more verse. There's a veteran missionary. Her name is Beth Grant. She told the General Council of the Assemblies of God, Do not show me God is not intimidated by the darkness of this world. Do not show me how Pentecostal you are in a church. Show me how Pentecostal you are in the darkness. We are a Pentecostal church. We are supposed to be a light in the darkness, just like my daughter's name. Light is more powerful than the darkness. So I am begging that you would help partner with us so that we would be able to reach those on the banks of the Gambia River to have them say and truly mean, Isa Amasi Limu Marioti, Jesus the Christ is Lord. Got one last verse, and then I'm going to have you stand for prayer. John chapter 4, 35 says, Say ye not, there are four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look to the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. Now, I am not a farmer, nor the son of a farmer. But I do know that wheat and barley do not turn white when they are ripe. They turn white when they are about to die. They turn white when they are beginning to rot and beginning to spoil. Jesus is not saying that it is time for harvest. He is saying it is past time to harvest these souls. They are dying and they are going to hell. We have a job to do. He said this 2,000 years ago. How much more desperate is the time that we are in today? So if you'll stand... We're going to pray for four things. Well, pray for three things and believe for a fourth. First, we are going to pray for an outpouring of the Spirit, just like on the first day of Pentecost. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us and give us purpose and give us empowerment to do his work. Secondly, we are going to pray for a harvest in this community right here in Texas County. 
We are going to pray that God would begin to open up people in the public schools to have you easily witness to the students. We're going to pray that people in your jobs will come to you so that because they are having dreams that Jesus is speaking to them. We are going to pray that God is going to let you into your hospitals and miracles are going to happen because we are praying for a harvest in this community. And thirdly, we're going to pray for a harvest amongst the nations. Because we believe that we are called to all nations everywhere. Every person deserves to have the gospel. And the last thing we are going to do is we are going to believe that as we fulfill the mission of God, that the Holy Spirit will go before us with signs and wonders for the completion of his kingdom. So I ask right now whoever's uh, coming to the piano or whoever's doing music, if you'll come. And I want everyone to raise your hands. Holy Spirit, right now I ask that you would come down. God, I ask right now that you would begin to open hearts and minds. Lord, I ask right now that your spirit would fall out on all flesh. God, we have been here learning about you, but God, now it is time for us to seek after you. So if you are out here, I want you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life. If you're already filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to pray in the Spirit. I want you to begin to pray that God would continue to move in your church and those around you. So right now we are asking for a move of the Holy Spirit to come down. Lord, I ask. Now I want you to specifically start praying for specific people in your community that are lost. I want you to come up with a loved one that you know does not know Jesus. I want you to come up with a coworker or a classmate that doesn't know Jesus. And I want you to specifically pray that God would go before you and open the doors for you to make introductions to Jesus. I want you to call out specific names right now. God, right now, I ask that when we get back to the Gambia, Lord, that you would help me reach Pa Usman. Lord, that you would come before me, that you would speak to him, God. Lord, that you would give him dreams and visions, Lord, so that we will be able to come, Lord, and make the introductions for you, God. Lord, I ask right now, Lord, that you would do the same, God. Lord, that you would move, Lord. God, Lord, that you would move with Charlie, oh God, Lord, that you would move with Dudu, God, Lord, that you would move, oh God, Lord, with Njai, Lord, that you would begin to speak to their hearts, God, Lord, that you would open them, Lord, that you would soften them, Lord, that they would come, Lord, more after you, God. I pray, God, for Musa as he's already started to come to church, God, Lord. I pray that you would continue to break his heart, God, Lord, that you would move in his life, Lord, that he would be one of the fula who would serve you, oh God. Lord, I pray, Lord. And now we want to pray for the nations. I know that not all of you have specific experience with specific people groups. But I want you to pray that the Lord of the harvest would call forth laborers because the task is great. So now we're going to pray that God would call people into the mission field. And that we would go into the ends of the earth for the gospel. God, I pray right now that you would continue to call forth laborers. God, that you would move in this place, Lord, that you would continue, God, to call forth, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move, that your Holy Spirit would guide. Lord, I ask that you would move in this place, Lord. Worship you, Lord. I praise you. God, worship you. And now, for the last point, we are going to believe in the supernatural. We are going to believe that miracles are going to happen. 
How many of you in here need a financial miracle, need a healing, need some way for God to move in your life? If that's you, I want you to raise your hands because we are going to believe that the Holy Spirit is going to go before us with signs and wonders as we do what he has called us to do. So, Heavenly Father, right now I pray, God, that you would begin to open up lives, Lord, that you would begin to bless financially, God. Lord, that you would begin to heal sickness, God. We rebuke cancer, God. We pray that you would open up wombs, God. We pray right now that you would move with signs and wonders, God. We pray that you would open blinded eyes, God. We pray that you would mend broken bones, God. We pray that you would go forth, that surgeons would be confused because as they get ready for surgery and as they prep for surgery, all the sudden the surgery is not needed. God, we pray right now that you would move before us. God, we pray that you would break down addictions. God, we pray that you would set people free from their sins. God, we pray that you would call people out of lives of sin. That God, we pray that you would pull people out. Lord, we pray that God, you would go to thieves and just like of Zacchaeus, they would go and pay back those they have stole from. God, we pray that you would call out people from the nations for your harvest. And we pray that you would do this in a miraculous way. God, we believe that you want the miraculous in our lives. God, we pray and we believe that you want the supernatural in our our lives. So we are asking God for you to show up because we know that that is your plan and has been your plan from the beginning. Pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here in just a moment, Brother Chooks is going to come and pray for Jordan and Alex as we leave this place today. I thought it would be appropriate for our, for our brother to pray a blessing over them. And uh, as he's going to lead us in prayer, the, the thought that comes to my mind is, Jordan, you said seventy-five hundred dollars to build the church building in Africa. I think we can. I think we can find seventy-five hundred dollars. We'll we'll make that happen in the in the days to come. And uh, if the Lord puts that upon your heart, like He's putting it upon my heart, just mark it, mark it Africa. We'll make sure it goes where we need to go. But seventy-five hundred dollars to give to give these ministers. The Lord's raised up the ministers. Let's give them the buildings they need. And may one tabernacle for the Chukes turn into two, and may two turn into four. And may days when the Lord returns, may he find buildings all across Africa, not just Gambia, but all across Africa. May he find many buildings for his harvest. But the Chukes, would you close us in prayer? Would you pray over Jordan and Alex as you lead this moment, my friend? Hallelujah. I will ask you to come up. Church, I just want us to stretch forth our hands to this family. I'm an African. I know what he's saying. When you talk about Gambia, you talk about fanatic Muslims. I have pastors that are there. They are difficult to reach out to. He has been through the toughest part in ministering gospel to the people. They need your prayer. They need your support. We are going to pray for them that as they go, that the presence of God will accomplish them. You've been to a place where when you make mention of Jesus, your head will be ripped off. That is where they are. That is where they are taking their children to. They are not thinking of any other thing. All for Jesus. They need you. We are going to pray that the presence of God will accomplish them. That Lord will protect them from every ambush of the enemy. Because the Bible says in the heart of the king lies in his hand an eternity like rivers of living water. That every heart that we see these people, we bow to them. Father, in the name of Jesus, the ancients of days, the eternal king of glory, the I am that I am will come before you to the God. Because we know that all that is in your hand is in a safer hand, so God. So therefore, Lord, we commit 
your sons and your daughter into your able hands, Lord. We pray that your presence will go before them and go behind them, O oh God. As they go to Gambia, may you use them, O oh God, Father, to minister to lives, God. Use them, O oh God, to reach out to souls over there. That heart will be cultivated for your word in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for the kids that are going with them, O oh God. Let your presence be with them. We pray for the wife, O oh God. Father, it is not easy. But Lord, with you, O oh God, where this courage want to take a place, O oh God, Father, may you fill it with faith in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, that you see them with the blood of Jesus. Because your word says, by the blood, we shall cross over. Lord, I cross them over every hurdle of life in the name of Jesus. I cross them over every plan and plot of the enemy in Gambia in the name of Jesus. That anywhere they step, Lord God, that your presence will speak for them in the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, may them walk in your wings. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You say signs and wonders shall follow they that believe God. They are going in your name, O God. Accomplish their full step with signs and wonders and miracle, God. That we turn Gambia for Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We commit every heart here present into your hands, O oh God. Father, Lord, we pray for faith to stand for you and for you alone. Thank you, Father, for your healing. Thank you for breakthrough today. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you, God, for all the miracles that have happened here, Lord. Even the one our eyes cannot see, God. Lord, we say thank you, Lord. Because you are in charge. There is no power that is greater than your power. We bless your name. Thank you for your servant, Pastor Paul. We pray, Lord, that you continue to use him and his family, God. Take the glory, Lord. Lord, even as we have said it, O oh God, that church will be built, O oh God. The finance is in your hands. Our morning is yours, O oh God. Father, help us, Lord, to give our heart. And at the same time, give the morning for your work. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Everyone agree, say amen. amen. God bless amen. you. May be blessed. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday.